passage over in uh, Ephesians 4. Of course, John doesn't know it's there yet, but the Lord does, because his words for settled forever in heaven. In Ephesians 4.14, where he says, Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, and slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby the lion wait to deceive. So he says, What went you out to see? In the wilderness, a reed shaken in the wind? Uh, you see, what he's doing, he's making fun of their religious leaders. He said, what went you out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? John wasn't wishy-washy, tossed to and fro. He stood up boldly and said, thus saith the Lord. He wasn't tossed to and fro and said, now it could be perhaps this, or the, the scriptures could have really said this, and it's unfortunate that scribal ears, he wasn't wishy-washy, shaken in the wind. Uh, Ephesians 4.14, he stood there and said, thus saith the Lord. He said, a reed shaken in the wind? Christ says again, but what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? He's trying to see some kind of effeminate? You get these preachers up and they, on television, they got ruffles on their shirt and bow tie, or, you know, and what, you know, that guy, you've seen that kook on TV, has got a big globe on there, and he's got ruffles sticking out, and he's all wearing his soft clothing. He said, a man in soft raiment, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. You see, the, uh, the priests and Pharisees wore real nice material, real slick stuff. And he said, he didn't wear that, he wore camel skin. He said, but what went you out to see? A prophet, yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Now, even though John is doubting here, Jesus Christ does not put him down in front of the enemies. He, he builds him up. See what he's doing? He doesn't put him down and tear John apart in front of the enemies. He says, what went you out to see? A prophet, yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Verse 10, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. That's Malachi 3.1. Malachi 3.1. If you have it in your margin, you can circle it. You remember over there in Mark chapter 1, verse 2, it says, as it is written in the prophets, remember that passage? And all the new Bibles change it, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and after it says Isaiah the prophet, it quotes Malachi, and then it hits Isaiah. And those Bibles are dead wrong. Those Bibles are wrong. And here's the passage quoted just from Malachi. Now look at verse 11. This is good. You need to show some people this today. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Turn to John chapter 10. This is a nugget. <laughs> I bet you could show this to somebody in one week if you kept your ears open and wasn't ashamed of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, this will flat knock somebody to pieces. John 10, 41. John 10, 41. Look at it. Now, what, did Jesus Christ say John was great? He said, nobody's been greater than John. John 10, 41, And many resorted unto him and, and said, John did no miracle. But all the things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed. They believed because he spake. John was a great man. He never did a miracle. Do you have to be great? Do you have to do miracles to be great? You see what I'm after? You see what I'm after? <laughs> you don't have, people say today, if you, don't have, if you don't have miracles in your church, you're not a good church. John was the greatest man ever lived, Jesus Christ said, and he did no miracle. John never spoke in tongues. Jesus Christ never spoke in tongues one time. Now you think about that. The Son of God never spoke in tongues. Isaiah didn't, Abraham didn't, Elijah didn't, Moses didn't. None of them spoke in tongues. None of them back there. John the Baptist didn't speak in tongues. John, among women, there hath not risen a greater. And John did no miracle. He did no miracle. Now again, uh, uh, Matthew 11, verse 11 Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And that means positionally or dispensationally. That's what that's referring to. And there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Nobody's been pure or more holy than him. Now, we're, we're greater than John the Baptist in our position. Now, what do I mean by that? He said, among them that are born of women. We've been born again. John was not circumcised by the Holy Spirit. He was not sealed by the Holy Spirit. He had no idea of many of these things that we're talking about. And so uh, John was born of women, but we're born again. Now look, look down there at verse 12. Verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it. Circle the word, little pronoun, it. Because it has to have an antecedent, and it refers back to the kingdom of heaven. He says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. 
Look at John 6.15. John 6.15. And that means, you know who had it right now? The Romans had it. They took it by force. Nebuchadnezzar had it earlier. And Medio Persia and uh, many different groups. John chapter 6, verse 15. John 6.15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force... To make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. He didn't want to be made a king by force. He wanted to come in God's timing. When they came to make him a king by force, and so it says here, Now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Uh, another thing in John, there might be something else there. I don't, I don't have this written down, but it might be good. Uh, I think it's chapter 18, John 18, 36. Yes, that'll work. John 18, 36. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Why? Because the Jews rejected it. Uh, John uh, 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, that's the key words in all the new Bibles, take out the words, but now. Most of them do, I should say. But now is my kingdom not from hence. You see, he said, but now, because they rejected him. He said, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would what? Fight. You know what you're going to come back on white horses of Jesus Christ? You're going to come back with him to execute judgment upon all them of their ungodly deeds, which the ungodly have committed, Jude, verse 14 and 15. And so we will fight someday. Uh, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 and look at verse 12 again. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Uh, and if you want another converse, a comparison, write down Luke 16, 16 by verse 13. Luke 16, 16. Just a verse of comparison. Um, another thing. Notice in verse 14. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. Now we'll explain the Elias there in a moment. But notice he says in 14 again, And if ye will receive it, the kingdom of heaven, if you'll receive it, this is the Elias which was for to come. Now, well, here's a spiritual application you can make. The, violence come, the violent come and take it by force. It's a picture of people trying to bombard heaven with their good works. That's what it's a picture of. You don't storm heaven with good works. You receive it. You see the picture? And the violent take it by force. Verse 14, and if you will receive it, you don't take it by force. You have to receive it under God's conditions, and God's conditions is righteousness. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So you don't take it by force. You don't bombard heaven with works. You receive it. And that's a spiritual application for this age. Now look at verse 14 again. And if you will receive it, what's that? The kingdom of heaven, the literal, visible, physical uh, kingdom on this earth, David, Jesus Christ on the throne of David, ruling with a rod of iron in the millennium for a thousand years after the tribulation. And again, if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He says, if you would have accepted the kingdom, John the Baptist would have been Elijah. But because you rejected the kingdom, Elias is yet still to come. And how do we know that? Uh, Matthew chapter 17, and we'll cover it again when we get to Matthew 17. If you want to write down a passage here to explain it, write down Matthew 17. Uh, and if you were to receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. But since you didn't, then Elias is yet to come in the future. Yet to come in the future. And we'll hit that more thoroughly when we get to John or Matthew 17. Verse 15, notice, what he, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> After saying something like that, that John the Baptist would have been Elijah, the Lord needed, that was the right time to say that. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know why he said that? John, or, um, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, he said, you have uncircumcised ears. And he, Christ is saying, if you have ears, you need to hear. And you, their ears were uncircumcised. Verse 16, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? He's given an illustration. Like, what illustration can I give? It is likened to children sitting in the markets. You know what kind of markets? The stock market. The common market. It's like children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. The children, you know how children play and, and make believe different things? Well, it's like children sitting there and saying, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. I say, come on, would you dance? We danced when you did it a moment ago. We've piped and you didn't play. We played a little bit. You're, you, come on, play with us. 
and he's making fun of them. To be honest with you, Jesus Christ is making fun. Where in Twilight shall I liken this generation? He said, you're childish. You're childlike. He said, we have piped unto you, and you have not danced. We have mourned, and you have not lamented. So they, pretend, they were pretending they were having a mock funeral. And they were going, and you now have not lamented. They were putting on a mock funeral. You go, you're not playing like we are. Come on, get serious, and let's have fun. And that's what he's saying to them. We have mourned and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Now what he's saying here, John, he says, John, he didn't come eating and drinking. You say you have a devil. He was separated, very much separated. Jesus Christ, of course, was separate from sinners, but he came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now, half of what they said about Jesus Christ was true. He was a friend of publicans and sinners, but he was not a wine bibber. The people that say Jesus Christ drank wine, they use this verse. This is his enemies accusing him. The only verse they can even show where Christ possibly could have ever drunk wine, the enemies are accusing him of this. Was Jesus Christ a glutton? Was he a glutton? Turn to Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21. If he was a glutton, he should have been stoned. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21. In Deuteronomy 21, verse uh, 19. Then shall his father and mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of the city, unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, and will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shalt thou put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. A glutton and a drunkard. And they, they claim Jesus Christ to be a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. Was he gluttonous? Absolutely not. He wasn't a wine bibber either. And then he said, a friend of publicans and sinners. And that is true. He was a friend of publicans and sinners. But just because he was a friend of publicans and sinners didn't mean he was getting drunk and being a glutton like they were. And they're trying to put the whole thing together. You know what Jesus Christ is saying? He, now, I, I use this word a lot, but Jesus Christ used it a lot. He's saying, you're hypocrites. He said, this man came this way to you. And you didn't like it. So another man, I sent a man, another man that did things different. You didn't like him either. They both had the same message. They both had the same message, but one had different standards, and this one had different standards. Both standards were right, and, but the message was the same. And you say, and, and you didn't like either one of them. You see what I'm trying to say? You go, God goes, I'll send one that you like that gets along with you. And it didn't matter what God sent, the message. They hated the message of the Word of God. They hate the message. And that's not unusual today at all. And notice he was a friend of publicans and sinners. <clears throat> now you want to get a balance. How much of a friend should you be of sinners? Hebrews 7.25, write it down and I'll read it to you. Hebrews 7.25, listen. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Write down verse 26 also. For such an high priest became us was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from God sinners made higher than the heavens jesus christ was separate from sinners how can you be separate from sinners and at the same time be a friend of publicans and sinners you need to pray for balance <laughs> that's very rough you need to be a friend of publicans and sinners and at the same time be separate from sinners and jesus christ did both he did both now, uh, look back at matthew 11 verse uh, 18 for john came neither eating nor drinking and they say he hath the devil and I used this before uh, as, a, as an example with Pastor Dumpert, being verse 18. And verse 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and wine bibber. And I use that as referring to me. And, then, and he said, A friend of publicans and sinners. And then Jesus Christ yawns. He goes, But wisdom is justified of her children. <laughs> he just kind of throws that on. Wisdom is justified of her children. He said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. I send one guy to you and I send another guy to you. Both have different standards. The same message. And it didn't matter what the standards were. The message is the problem. And I didn't get that from any commentary. <laughs> I guarantee it. Verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. And here he goes. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if... Now, you want to circle the word if. I think I had you do it when I taught you on Calvinism before. For if 
the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, underline the next four words, they would have repented. A long ago in sackcloth and ashes. You know, what the Bible, you know what the Calvinists say? They say only the elect can repent. And again, only the elect can repent, and the, all the elect will repent. Well, listen. He says they would have repented. You mean the elect went to hell? That's what, you know, see, boy, this really throws a door on a man. <laughs> I'm telling you, puts a wet blanket on him. He said, for if the word of God would have been preached to them, they would have repented. He said they would have repented. Christ, in his foreknowledge, knew they would have gotten saved had the word of God been preached to them. You know what that does? It puts the responsibility on us. And yet they were still judged and went to hell. They went to hell. They hadn't heard the word and went to hell. And the responsibility is on us. They, there's some people out there that will hear if we tell them. They will hear. And that takes away, if you, that, if you think Cal, you know, Calvinism will dampen your zeal to win souls. And it's a doctrine from the pits of hell. Right out of hell. He said, For if the mighty works were, which were done and you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it should be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And in the last chapter we showed the different degrees of judgment in hell. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, they think they're gods. You ever been in a city, they think they're God, everybody thinks they're really up, and if they're exalted to heaven, just like Satan in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, he tried to exalt his throne above the stars of God and be like the Most High. They were exalted to heaven, they are thinking they're God, thinking they're God. And he said, and thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Well, I'd be something to get up and preach to the town council and the police department. <laughs> he said, you're going to go to hell. He says, for if, circle the word if, for if the mighty works which have, which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. He said, they'd have got saved if the word of God had been preached there. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Hold your place here and turn to Luke chapter 10. Very unusual thing we're about to look at. Luke chapter 10. This is the only place in the Bible Jesus Christ is said to have rejoiced. How many like to rejoice and get on shouting ground, amen, and have a little blessings and fun? You know what Jesus Christ rejoiced at? God making, stu God making fools out of smart people. <laughs> That's right. God got, uh, Jesus Christ got a kick and a laugh out of God making fools out of smart people. Look at Luke 10 and verse 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He says, notwithstanding in, re in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven, uh, paragraph mark, in that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. For so, Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. The only place that says Jesus Christ rejoiced and he started laughing and enjoying himself and said, praise God. He got a kick out of God hiding truth from smart people. <laughs> and the more you read the Bible, that's, that is funny. You've got to admit, that is funny. God hides the truth from people that think they're smart and makes fools out of smart people. You know what the Bible says? God taketh a wise in their own craftiness. And you read the thing about that. I wonder why no theology books talk about what Jesus Christ thought about smart people. Theology books ought to say what Jesus Christ thought about smart people. There's hundreds of verses on it. I'm serious. I'm serious. You go through the Corinthians and through the Old Testament. There are so many verses of what God thinks about smart people. He doesn't think very much. He doesn't think very much. And look back at Matthew 11.25. Matthew 11.25. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. They think they're smart, think they know it, think they understand the truth. You have to humble yourself. They were proud. That's the idea. And God hides truth from a proud person and reveals truth to a humble person. He said, you revealed them to babes. <laughs> That's good. I, I, I think the Lord's really got a sense of humor. Look at verse 26. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Verse 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. 
And that's interesting. Jesus Christ has power to reveal God to a man or power to hold, withhold, the, withhold God from him. Christ, all power is given to Christ. If Christ wants to reveal the Father to this guy, he will. If he doesn't want to, to this guy, he won't. And what's the context? Hiding the truth from the wise and prudent and revealing it to babes. And you know, Christ, that shows Christ is God. You know what else it shows? Some people, they, we have some uh, organizations today, they believe, we, we believe in God. And that's all they believe in. They just say God. And uh, be honest with you, it's the blue book, Alcohol Anonymous. That's one main one I think of. And if you say Jesus Christ, at least the ones I've been to, you are in trouble. I've been to them, and they have said, if you don't shut up right now, it's right after I got saved, I'm going to knock you apart. And there was policemen in there and a judge, Judge Thomas, which was killed. The mafia killed him and put him across a rain railroad track and killed him afterwards. And he tried to help me an awful lot. They killed him right down there um, by the Elm Inn. And they killed Judge Thomas, a man that cared and loved people. I don't think he was a saved man, but he loved uh, the wicked people and tried to reach down and help them. And, uh, and, I, and I was witnessing to those guys in there, and they said, don't say that name. Don't say that name. And the thing is, if you, you can't know the Father without the Son. You've got to get a hold. Don't we'll fall into some religion when they talk about God. Who cares about God without Jesus Christ? You can't know God without Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And all through the scriptures, the scriptures teach that. Many places. That's John 14, 6. Now look at verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, let's look at some definitions of what it means to be laden. Look at Psalm 38. Psalm 38. Psalm 38. Psalm 38, look at verse 4. Psalm 38, verse 4. For mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. And that's talking about he had a burden. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Talking about burdens and having a burden, being laden. For mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. See, you know when he says, come unto me, all of their labor and heavy laden? It's burdened with sin. The, the load and weight of sin is so heavy, pressing down upon you. Look again at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, verse 4. Isaiah 1.4, he says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Verse 4 again, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. Laden with iniquity. Now, uh, get also Isaiah 48, if you're still there. Isaiah 48, and we'll just hold that for a moment. Isaiah 48. Now, come back to um, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. That's what sins and iniquities. And I will give you rest. You know what rest that is? Salvation's rest. That's salvation's rest. Because another rest in a little bit is not salvation's rest. It's the believer's rest. Verse, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. There's a picture of the believer's rest, not salvation's rest. If you want something to compare with that, the rest in verse 28 is a comparison with peace with God. And the rest in verse 29 is the peace of God. It's peace with God is salvation. The peace of God is the, um, the, the believer's rest. All right, now that's if that, you can find that in Philippians 4, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. Also in uh, Romans 5, 1. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. know what a yoke is a picture of? Picture of the cross. It goes across them like this, and it comes down. That's a picture of the cross, where Christ hung upon the cross. Take my yoke upon you. Now, that's works. That's works. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, listen. You can't learn this book unless you're willing to live for him. You see what I'm saying? You want to say, what's the key to understanding this Bible? Then taking this verse in its order. Take my yoke upon you, number one, and learn of me. You want to learn this Bible? You need to take his yoke upon you. 
and learn of him. That's the order of understanding the scriptures. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why? For I, I have several degrees in the great colleges, and, uh, and I'm a great man. I've won 4,000 souls. We're running 10,000 in Sunday school. We have 62 buses. Uh, no, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That's why. A big difference. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your souls. There's the believer's rest. Verse 28 is the salvation's rest. And notice what he says. For my yoke is hard and my burden, burden is heavy. You know, I've said that to you before. You need to get a hold of that. Some people think the Christian life is hard and heavy, but it's not. It, you, you, you're, not you're pulling the plow by yourself, if it is. You're pulling, you know, when you take a yoke upon you, Christ is in the other side. Christ is pulling with you. And you might be pulling by yourself. It gets pretty tough when you, don't, when you leave Jesus Christ out of your life and don't get in the, prayer, the Bible that day or praying that day, and you're pulling the yoke all by yourself. And the furrow gets, gets pretty deep and hits a rock, and boy, it gets really rough. That's right. You know, you get by yourself, you get by yourself in a thing, and you go circles. You, go, you do circles on a plow. You need to have two, man. You go straight. You need to spend time with Jesus Christ in the morning, get in the Bible, or you'll be pulling the yoke by yourself that day. And you want to, boy, things are tough today. I just don't have time to get in my Bible. You need to make time, and you'll have better time. You can make, God will make more use of your time throughout the day. Um, another place, turn to Mark 4.24. I want another passage here, Mark 4.24. He says in Mark 4.24, Mark 4.24, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And with what ye hear, shall more be given. Whatever you hear, God more will be given to you. If you hear it and do something with it, God will give more to you. Uh, another place, let me show you this one, Hebrews 5.14. We've discussed this before, but if you want the key to understanding this book, here it is, again, Hebrews chapter 5. Of course, believing it, but if you say, well, preacher, I believe it, I still don't understand it, here it is. Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful on the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of, key word, use. And I, you have it circled from probably in the past. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. He said if you use what God has given you, he'll give you more. He'll give you strong meat. Are you using what God has taught you? Otherwise, you're just the Dead Sea. The, the Jordan just keeps flowing into it and flowing into it and flowing into it. And the Dead Sea, that's why it's dead. It doesn't have any outlets. No outlet. And you become stagnant and stink as a Christian. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full, full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. If you use what God shows you, strong meat belongs to you. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 um, verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden is light. And now, if you want to write down a passage beside that, write down 1 John 5, verse 3. And that says, and his commandments are not grievous. <laughs> his commandments are not grievous. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 3. Look at chapter 12. We'll, we'll go down to the paragraph mark in verse 14. Chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pick the ears of corn and to eat. Uh, now, this, this is, I believe, real corn, yellow corn that you put butter and salt on, not, not grain like they, like, they, like they try to tell you and discredit the word of God. I believe it was uh, in Moundsville, Alabama, in Moundsville, Alabama, they found Egyptian pottery buried in Moundsville, Alabama with corn. A whole bunch of corn in this Egyptian, pot, Egyptian pottery. Well, you know who brought it with them. The blacks brought it with them when they brought them over for slaves. And they brought some of that stuff and they buried it. And it had been there a long time. And this is pottery that had been sealed and not opened for thousands of years. And they found it in Moundsville, Alabama, Egyptian pottery with corn in it. And it was over here in 1611. They found that. It was over here when they came over in, in 1492. There was corn here. And if you want to write down a passage, you might have it in the margin. Deuteronomy 23, 25. It's probably in your margin, Deuteronomy 23, 25. Now, why, 
Why would Jesus Christ on the Sabbath go through? Why would he pick corn? And he knew that the Pharisees were going to accuse him of picking corn on the Sabbath. He knew that. Why, why didn't Jesus Christ just go and create some corn and give it to him to eat? He could have done that, you know. The Lord could have just went, corn. And they could have had corn with salt and butter and those little stickers in it and napkins and everything else and had a picnic table spread for him. And, you know, the Lord just didn't want to do it. He knew the Pharisees were going to get mad and he liked to irritate them. I think he liked to irritate them. He knew it. He's God Almighty. And, and at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Now, you know, what the, you know whose fault it is that they have to do this? It's Israel's fault. Look at chapter 10, verse 10. Chapter 10, verse 10. He says, Don't take scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his what? Meat, food. They're, pre they're supposed to be preaching the word of God, and Israel is not taking care of the preachers like God said. So God's providing for them some way. God's providing. And on the Sabbath day, and the Lord knew it was the Sabbath. That was all a setup on, by the Lord's part. The Lord set this whole thing up. In verse 2, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read? <laughs> I mean, just rubs it in. Haven't you been reading your Bible? And, you know, when you, once you get to know your Bible real well, that's a way good thing to answer people. Have you not read? You do err not knowing the Scriptures, then quote it to them. Or have you not read? And quote them a Scripture. I'm talking about the cults and different things. Have you not read? Quote. And that just irritated them because they, they, they were familiar with this passage, but having eyes, they perceived not. They perceived not. And he said unto them, Have you not read? That's ten times in, in the Gospels. Have you not read what David did when he was unhungered and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but for the priest only, or only for the priest? Now, he just looked like he criticized David. But what he's doing, he just, he's just edging it in there just to irritate him. He goes, David did that which was not lawful too. No, David was lawful because David was prophet, priest, king. And if you want a passage for that, look at, uh, write this down. It might be in your margin. Luke 24, 9, saying it's perfectly lawful for the priest to eat showbread. Leviticus 24, verse 9, probably in your margin, showing it's all right. David was prophet, priest, king. What is Jesus Christ? Prophet, priest, king. And you know, the Lord just happened to pull, when, pull, out, pull out of the context. Look at verse 4 again, verse 3. He said, didn't you know what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? David was a king in exile. You know what Jesus Christ is? A king in exile. And you know what that's found? That's found in 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 6. It might be in your margin. 1 Samuel 21, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. David was a king in exile... And he's taken this corn. He's prophet, priest, and king. David offered up a sacrifice in the last chapter of 2 Samuel. The last chapter. And Urana the Jebusite, in the floor of Urana the Jebusite, he offered it up. Why? Because he numbered Israel and God was judging him for it. David was a prophet, priest, and king, exactly as a type of Jesus Christ. David was a king in exile, just like Jesus Christ. Notice verse, uh, four, verse 5. Look what he says again. Or have you not read... He's just rubbing it in. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? <laughs> you think about that. He said, have you not read how the, the priests are in the temple on the Sabbath and they profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Now how could they profane it and be blameless? They're, you know why? How about me? How about the Seventh-day Adventists? When the Seventh-day Adventists say something to you, and you know what they're doing? The preacher gets up on Saturday and he'll preach a message. You know what he's doing? He's working. He's profaning the Sabbath and yet blameless. And people say, preacher, we need to rest on Sunday. Man, I, I rest less than anybody on Sunday. I am so whipped after Sunday. I'm if, if we were to rest on Sunday and keep it like we do the Old Testament, then that would be an example. I would be profaning this day and I would be blameless by my work. You see what I'm trying to say? And so he's kind of he's using this thing and just coming right in with a sword. With a, it's got a rusty blade on it. It really hurts. And he said, and they profane the Sabbath and are blameless. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. You know where they are? They're out in a cornfield. They're out in a cornfield. He said that in this place there's one greater than the temple. And you know who that is? Jesus Christ. You know what the new versions say? Look what the new versions say. But I say unto you that in this place is something greater than the temple. They put something. 
What's that? And that's what they put. The new version put something greater than the temple. It took out the deity of Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews 3.3. 3. Hebrews 3.3. 3. In Hebrews 3.3, 3, it says, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Who, whoever's built the house hath more honor than the house. This world, in a sense, is called a house. Jesus Christ built the house. The temple's his. He built everything. He made everything. And so he says, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. You know what that shows? He said, I can break the Sabbath anytime I want. Although Christ was not doing it, you know, according to the law. But he said, I can break it anytime. Well, you know what? It's a ceremonial law. It isn't a moral law. I mean, it isn't something like they're saying, you committed adultery. That's a moral law, something Christ would have upheld. This is a ceremonial law. And, the, you know, the Lord made the law of gravity, but he can defile it any time he wants. He can just go right up to heaven. Christ go right up to right up and ascend into heaven. He can, he can change his laws any time he jolly well pleases. And the, and the reason he can change this one is because it's ceremonial, not moral. Verse 7 of, of Matthew 12. But if you had known what this meaneth, he's rubbing in this, he goes, you don't know what the scriptures mean. You need to go back to school. <laughs> but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. You wouldn't have condemned my buddies, all my apostles and disciples. You wouldn't have condemned them. He says, either you're going around sacrificing and judging everybody and not having mercy. That's Hosea 6.6. 6. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. He's saying, I instituted the Sabbath. And they're looking at him saying, you saying you're God? That's absolutely right. I'm God. Notice what he said, for the Son of Man, notice it says, man is Lord. Man is Lord. Now that doesn't mean all man, that doesn't mean mankind, but that's just showing the, the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ at the, son of, the same time. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had, which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? They didn't care about an answer. They were just trying to accuse him. And when he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Is there an answer? No, nope, no answer. They didn't say a word. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Did they answer? No answer. Wherefore is it lawful to do well? No, he said, Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. He answers them. He said, yes, absolutely, as well to do right. Now notice, every time they, Jesus, they ask Jesus Christ, this would be a great message, and I'm going to preach one one of these days. I've never preached it. I've kind of uh, hit on it back in South Dakota. Every time somebody asks Jesus Christ a question, he answers it. Every time he asks them a question, they don't answer it. It's a picture of the man. He said, he said how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Every time he asks a question, and he says they durst not ask him any more questions. <laughs> Every time they ask him, he answers. And if you go through and find all those in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's a picture of the great white throne judgment. They ask him, but Lord, what about this? And they throw all kinds of things in his face. He answers. And he asks them a question. And they just get their head keeps hanging lower and lower. And he says, depart from me, you cursed in an everlasting fire. Beautiful picture. I shouldn't say beautiful. A good message for the great white throne judgment is what I should say. And so he answers their questions. He said, which of you, if you had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, they will not lay hold of it. Man, they'd get cranes and all kind of uh, men to come down there and ropes and hoist, and they'd hire a whole army to come down and get that sheep out of there. You know why? The love of money is the root of all evil. That's why. And they're saying that a sheep is more important than a child of Abraham that had a withered arm. They're putting more, more emphasis on the love of money as the root of all evil than a man that has a withered arm. They care more about a sheep that fell into a pit than a guy that has a withered arm. Now watch it again. They care more about pigs than a demon-possessed man. You remember when the maniac of Gadara was healed and the, he took those, the demons and put them into the swine and the swine ran violently down a steep cliff and were choked in the deep? Remember that? And they went in the city and told the people and they desired that he depart out of their country. Remember that? They were more concerned about a prophet and money-making than about a demon-possessed man being healed. We've got to watch that we don't be like that. And he says in verse 12, How much then is a man better than a sheep? 
Wherefore is it lawful to do... Or no, he said, wherefore, it, it's not a question here. It's a statement. Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. You know, the, the man sitting like this, never had his hand stretched forth in his life. This one's well, he could shake, and his hand's all messed up like this. He said, man, stretch forth thine hand. The Lord always telling you to do things you can't do. The man's going, I can't do it. You know, if he goes, it's impossible. I've been like this all my life. The Lord says, try it. No man, it's not even worth trying. I can't. I've tried all my life. He goes, I'm not going to try it. What if the man wouldn't have tried? You see, the Lord's always telling you to do something that you've never done before. And you say, well, I can't do that. Try it. The Word of God told you to do it. God will enable you to do it. God won't tell you anything that he won't help you to do. And the man went, and it came out just like that. He's going, can you imagine that man's excitement? Listen. And the Lord will tell you to do something you've never done before. Try it. What if this man wouldn't have put forth his hand? And he stretched it forth and it was restored whole like as the other. Just like Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He said, put thy hand on thy bosom take it and take it out and it was leprous. He said, put it back in again and pull it out and it was, it was clean. Just like flesh. Just like the other hand. Just like Moses did in Exodus chapter 3. Signs to Israel. Verse 14. Matthew 12, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him how they might destroy him. Uh, notice, they just saw a miracle. He just proved who he was by a miracle showing the messianic signs. And they went out and held a counsel how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, wouldn't it be rough working with somebody that knew everything you thought? When Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself. Now, there's such a thing as when trouble comes, you use common sense. Sometimes you stand up to it. And you take it, and sometimes that you withdraw yourself and hide. There's a sometimes where running is the right thing to do. And it didn't say he ran, but that's, an, that's a good way to explain it. There's a time to run, there's a time to stand. And it says, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. No misfires, no duds. He healed them all, every single one. It didn't, he didn't say, release your faith, hold on to your faith, express your faith. Have faith, he healed them all. Verse 16, and he charged them that they should not make him known. He said, Don't tell anybody. Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, and of course that's Isaiah, it's the New Testament way to say it, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, quote, and the, the quote here, verse 18, 19, 20, and 21, that quote is from Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. If you have that in the margin, maybe you want to circle it or mark it. That's Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. He says in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. He said, I'm well pleased. Uh, what, what, uh, when, did, when did God say he was well pleased with his son? Remember when he was baptized, there was a voice came from heaven, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And so whom my soul is well pleased, over in Isaiah, for well pleased it says delighted. Just another way to understand what well pleased means. God was delighted in his son. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. That's the key word in this passage. You want to circle that word, not just underline it, circle Gentiles, or mark it in red or something. And now he keeps quoting, keeps quoting verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till, important word, there's a time period, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles, there it is, circle it again, Gentiles trust. Now why did Christ in verse 16 say, don't tell anybody? Because if they would have made him king, they would have made him king, and he could not have come, and, and uh, uh, the church age would not have been here. He, he, didn't, he didn't want that, the Jews to be telling everybody, because he was thinking about you, 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 me. That's why in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Uh, so he wanted to go to the cross and, and the church age and different things like this coming up. So verse 16, and he charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, Behold my servant in whom I have chosen, my beloved whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. And yet many people heard Christ's voice in the streets. 
What's it mean when they said he did not, nobody heard his voice in the streets in the way of uh, being a, a revolutionary? Jesus Christ was not a revolutionary. He was, he was not trying to cause sedition or insurrection. That's what it means. When he said you didn't hear his voice in the streets, I mean, he wasn't a person causing insurrection, and a revolutionary, a sedition. Uh, he shall not strive nor cry, neither shall hear his voice in the streets. Verse 20. A bruised reed shall he not break. Now this is interesting. A reed is like a picture of a man out there. He's a shepherd and, and working with sheep. And he, he just sits down. He's watching the sheep. They're grazing. He takes out his pocket knife, a case or a buck, I'm sure, back then. And he took that piece of reed and he carved out some notches in it and fixed the thing up. And he started playing with a flute, playing with a flute. And he might, you know, be having his pocket and walk along. And he could drop the thing. Or he might bump against the tree and it, it just kind of bend it. You know, you ever get a straw and it gets like a bend in it? You try to suck something out of the straw and it's got a bend. It's just all messed up once the straw's got a bend in it. What do you do with it? Do you, you try to repair it? You just throw it away, don't you? A straw that's got a bend in it, you just, just doesn't work anymore. Or it collapses. Well, that's the idea of this reed here. And the reed, uh, he said, a, a bruised reed shall he not break. Well, an ordinary man would break it. But see, that reed represents your life. And you know, you're supposed to play beautiful music for God. You're supposed to be playing beautiful music and pleasing in His sight. Of course, this is a spiritual application. And the Lord plays music and uses you as an instrument, and meat, sanctified meat for the Master's use. And He plays music through your life to glorify Him. And sometimes you get bruised. Well, the Lord just didn't say, that's it, and throws it away. The Lord, the Lord cares about you. He don't throw away a bruised reed. He keeps